legends, cast for which he was responsible and a witch against which he battled in his career. Let's take a look at this grid and for fans of 1980s Formula One, what a mouth-watering prospect. Cosworth engines, pre-turbo era, ground effect cars, starting with Mark Hazel on pole position in the FW07. Last yesterday afternoon's top six from the race result reversed. So Jamie Constable starts fifth, Steve Brook, Ken Tyrrell uh, starting third and fourth, Steve Hartley in fifth place, and race one winner Mike Cantillon starts in sixth position. From their back, they start where they finished in the race. So Christoph Danseborg in his FW07 starts ahead of the Theodore of Philip Hall. Mark Higson's McLaren MP41B, the second in the field ahead of the uh, only 012 Tyrrell of Ian Simmons. Two uh, shadows, both from the same year but with different liveries. Mark Harrison has got the black one and a row behind him, uh, two rows behind him, you insert three rows behind him, has got the red and white uh, Billiger Shadows. In between them, Enzymes, Marches, Minardis, and the Arrows A6 of Arthur Brooke, one of the two Arrows in the field. We have an A5 and an A6, so plenty to conjure with. No time set in qualifying by either of two Surtees, one of which failed to proceed yesterday, but we have the uh, Surtees uh, TS-16 of Charlie Kennedy at the back of the field. So that car making its way round behind everybody else. And Martin Haven in the commentary booth alongside me, Alistair Douglas. Alistair, always a joy for fans of any era to see Cos Cosworth Engine Grand Prix cars because they make such a fabulous noise. And they were all so damn different, weren't they? You could really tell what was what in this era before everybody had the same aerodynamic flick-ups and tears and cascades. They all look different. The liveries just take you by to uh, back to a, a maybe slightly... Am I being, for, uh, being naive here, a slightly more innocent era of Formula One? <laughs> I'm definitely being more is innocent, I think. Uh, but yes, uh, the, uh, yes, we've got also the, the different styles of cars because we've got cars that ran in the ground effect era, although sliding skirts are not allowed in, in this series, but uh, the cars still look the same. They're just not as efficient at sucking themselves onto the ground. But we've also got the earlier cars that uh, were, and the flat bottom cars as well. So. Uh, slightly different designs of cars and right at the very back actually the matchbox liveried surtees with that huge air intake which I think we used to call the snorkel wasn't it but the, yeah. there it is now that was very very common in that period but only one car in this grid has that snorkel air intake what that's doing is ramming the air down in through the the opening down onto the top of the engine where the intakes are for the engine so effectively it's it's not turbocharging, but it's kind of a way of turbocharging, pushing the air in at a higher pressure. Uh, and uh, uh, may remember James Hunt driving the Hesketh, and that had a very, very tall air box on it. Yeah, mattress particularly did as well. Uh, it, it, they, it, they went for a period. And the reason that it worked is because behind the driver's head was a lot of turbulence, and that's where the air intakes were for the injector trumpets. And so turbulent air is not as efficient as to get down the injectors and so you saw in later years later lotuses for instance would have had ears out either side of the driver's head with the air intakes but certainly there was uh, that mid to late 70s period where the high snorkel was all the rage and as you say that fabulous max bot matchbox 30s was uh, John Surtees had a real knack, didn't he, for getting British household names. Brook Bond Oxo, yes. Matchbox. I mean, really? <laughs> they, were, they were very much uh, part of the firmament. Well, these cars, because of uh, their big, fat, slick tyres and the need to get them really properly up to heat, will get a full extra lap of warm-up, so a chance to see them all. Of course, the Williamses are very easy to spot, the white and green Saudi Alalian Leyland Williamses, FW8s and FW07s. All three Tyrrells are in green, which was a brief period actually in Tyrrell's history when uh, the two 011s were sponsored by Benetton, the 012, which is a flat bottom car with very much shorter side pods, uh, a sizzly different sponsorship 
um, but uh, a very different look to them. But the two team cars, both from the same year, Jamie Constable and Ken Tyrrell, not the Ken Tyrrell who created Tyrrell, but another Ken Tyrrell, um, they are easily spottable. And of course, the JPS Lotus, the black and gold on the Lotus 91 of Steve Brooks, very easy to spot, as are the Deglo orange and white colours of the McLaren MP41s. And of course, when Ron Dennis was put in charge of McLaren, taking over from Teddy Mayer, um, the company originally created by Bruce McLaren, um, MP4, it was Marlborough who were the sponsors of the team who actually instigated the Palace coup, if you like, the change of, of ownership of McLaren. And MP4 won the first of their designs. Steve Nichols and John Barnard led the design team. The first ever carbon composite Formula One chassis built by Hercules in the America, who uh, were the uh, supplier to the, uh, the space shuttle program. And there is MP4 one, and of course those familiar colours of Marlborough, the Philip Morris Tobacco Company. Uh, when such things were allowed. Again, um, I, I, it's hard to say it was more innocent because I'm sure it was just as devilish and cutthroat. Maybe we were more innocent. Yeah, uh, uh, we. a lot of us will remember this particular car racing because this was the, the very chassis that John Watson took to the win in 1982 at uh, Detroit from 18th on the grid. He was second in Brazil, third in Canada in this very car uh, that Steve Hartley is driving, the number 77 car. Well, in some of our earlier races, Formula Junior, pre-66 Formula One cars and so on, we had lots of cars, and in Formula Two, lots of cars built by well-known manufacturers that were for sale to customers. These never were, so all of these cars were raced in period by drivers great and maybe not quite so well remembered. But then, the red and white car right at the back, that was the early days in that shadow, the Villiger shadow, Clay Regazzoni's Formula One career. So not everybody was immediately in a super competitive car, but all of these cars have period racing history with some very well-known names. Cars up to speed and flying around the Silverstone Grand Prix circuit. Charging through the old pit lane and the new pit lane alike in front of a mass crowd at the classic and led through by mark hazel on pole position in the williams fw 08c a 20-minute race for the masters racing legends late 70s early 80s cosworth engine formula one cars and they're all racing for the frank williams memorial trophy jamie constable in Tyrrell 011, number 99, right behind, then the black and gold. That is the Lotus 91 of Steve Brooks, who starts third. The top six from yesterday's race result reversed. Seventh on down as they finished. So Steve Hartley in the red and white, first of the McLarens, finished in fifth place, still in fifth behind. Mike Cantillon now, who's just made up a spot away from the grid. They stream past our commentary box. A sight that and sound that takes you right back to the early 80s, Alistair Douglas. Fabulous to see these cars really being driven aggressively around one of their most natural environments. Very much so, yes, as they go through into the Beckett sweepers for the first time competitively. And it's still out in the lead, the Mark Hazel Williams FW07B, followed by Jamie Constable in second place. Uh, an interesting early move there from Mike Cantillon to get past Steve Hartley, who in uh, uh, previous to the race he said to ed steve's in front of us well he's not anymore uh, so a very important move as round the outside goes uh, mark hazel after a big effort from jamie constable into stowe corner for the lead but uh, that didn't come off steve brooks is still in third place and in fourth place now i think that's mike cantillon isn't it who's moved up another place he's yes he's got past ken tyrrell so mike cantillon from sixth on the grid up to fourth Pale blue helmet in car number 99, Jamie Constable in the green denim livery Tyrrell. The uh, later Tyrrell 012 has got uh, Benetton livery. Looks like a right front wheel problem for the Surtees. That's very disappointing. Charlie Kennedy not going to get much video, I'm afraid, from that. The high air intake, the snorkel matchbox Surtees heading into the pit lane. 
And that looks like, unfortunately, an early end to their race. Mark Hazel, though, hanging on to the lead under attack from Jamie Constable. Number 27 is the Williams. Down the inside comes the Tyrrell. Ken Tyrrell following him. Are we going to get a Tyrrell 1-2 leading the British Grand Prix at Silverstone? Oh, sorry, getting carried away there a little bit. Uh, leading this race at Silverstone. Well, it's a Tyrrell 1-3 and Williams second and fourth. And I know, in fact, that's the Lotus that was in third. And through comes the Lotus, looking to take second play away, for, away from Mark Hazel. He does so. Spitfire A, Steve Brooks, driving through into second place. And car number seven, that's yesterday's race winner, Mike Cantillon, in third place. So we got Williams, Lotus, Williams. Into uh, Beckett's they go, and uh, as you say, the... Uh, Tyrrell leading from the Lotus, Jamie Constable taking the lead further back round this lap, but look at Mike Cantillon behind as they come onto the hangar straight now, they fan out, it's two abreast with Steve Brooks on the outside into Stowe Corner, but I think he's going to have to drop back in behind, yes he does, yeah. so Jamie Constable leads from Steve Brooks, but Mike Cantillon looking right, looking left, looking for a way through, I don't think there'll be room here, but will Steve Brooks give him room? Yes he, he does. does, he Steve, does indeed, yeah. Steve Brooks decides better, uh, better to let him through than uh, hold him up so up into second place goes Mike Cantillon what a stunning two laps from him yeah great start from Mike Cantillon great start as well from Jamie Constable yes he was on the front row of the group but he's just creeping away there there is Ken Tyrrell battling with number 27 Mark Hazel the second of the green at Tyrrells Mark Hazel now coming under attack down the inside on one side comes an FW07 around the back comes the MP141B uh, that's the second and the McLaren's Mark Hickson and Christoph Dansenborg on the outside so Constable getting proper uh, not Constable um, Tyrrell pro uh, getting properly beaten up there Jamie Constable leads uh, in second place, Mike Cantillon. Now, he's got by Steve Brooks. Steve Brooks haven't had a close look at, at that Lotus. If we do, I think we'll see that he is in a helmet in the colours of Elio De Angelis, who raced that car in period. And it does look as though Mike Cantillon in second place. Uh, actually, his helmet colours aren't that far, far away from those of Alan Jones when he comes towards you. But it is... Mike Cantillon running fastest. The lead still, though, is with Jamie Constable. So don't believe what it tells you on the screen. Now you can believe that Constable Lee, uh, that uh, Cantillon leads. Constable in second place, and Steve Brooks in third. Going through uh, Beckett's, uh, Steve Brooks there in the JPS. John Player Special Lotus uh, 91, the first carbon composite car produced by Lotus following McLaren's lead. Down into Stowe Corner they come. Mike Cantillon from Jamie Constable from Steve Brooks in third place. And just uh, harking back to the uh, village in the loop on the last lap, what a move from Steve Hartley to take two places in two corners in the MP41 McLaren. Uh, he's running in... Uh, Steve, uh, sorry, Steve, Steve Hartley in fifth place. Yeah, uh, there he is at the back. Yes, yeah. Yeah, just waiting for him to come onto screen. And he, his next target is Christoph Dansenborg in the FW07C. So sixth for Steve Hartley behind Dansenborg, and then Tyrrell is next up as well. But this is a great battle for the fourth, fifth, and sixth places. Steve Hartley does look a little though, as though he's losing a bit of ground. He was getting engaged with. Ken Tyrrell earlier on with Christoph Dansenborg, and both of them have dropped quite a long way back that, uh, behind that second Denon Tyrrell. And in the background, you can see the next of the Williams is coming into shot. That's a 27 car Mark Hazel. So he started on pole position, having finished six yesterday. All these cars will be on new tyres for today. So the first couple of laps still probably didn't have really all the heat they needed in them. You can lean on the ground effect, but it does need heat in the tyre as well. Cold tyre spins, desperately to be avoided. Mike Cantillon easing away from Jamie Constable. Steve Brooks in third place in that black and gold Lotus 91. It's not 100% uh, an Elio De Angelis liveried helmet, but certainly on the side, it looks uh, very reminiscent of uh, the Angelis' colours. Uh, number 27. The uh, big part, number 77, the uh, McLaren. Now closing in on the back of the Williams. 
Yes, just a little bit closer there as they come down the hangar straight. Uh, just looking to the inside a little bit of Christophe uh, Dansonbois as they turn into the right-hander. But uh, Mark Hazel, car number 27 now, he was up the front, wasn't he? Yeah. What's happened to him? Yeah, started on pole, finished sixth yesterday, and he's already dropped out of the top six down to seventh place. His last lap at one minute 59.2, the leader doing a 152.3, so a long way from the front running pace, Mark Hazel. That FW08C is newer than the two Williams is ahead of it, a, a season younger. But, uh, in fact, a couple of seasons younger, it's an 08C, so it uh, looks as though... Uh, 08, uh, sorry, 07B, right, so that's a, a change there to what I had written down. But nevertheless, he is definitely struggling for pace, and he had pretty decent pace yesterday, but that is not being replicated today. And uh, once again, Steve Hartley looks to be challenging uh, perhaps Christophe Dansonbois as they come. Yes, he very much is challenging, less than a car length between them as they come uh, from Brooklands into Luffield. Now Hartley goes tight, he'll try and hold that tight line on the exit through Woodcut, uh, but uh, actually the power of the Christophe Dansonbois FW07C uh, is actually better off the corner. They're both from a, a, a similar period, so uh, they should be very, very similar uh, performance through Cops Corner they go and then this wonderful shot that's been uh, available on cameras for so many years the uphill yeah. run into Maggot's Curve great shot that well it looked like Dunsenburg there sacrificed a little bit of speed on entry to Luffield to get that good run down the pit straight and that's why the McLaren closed on him so quickly and again if he can come off the chapel curve well here onto the hangar straight that just gives him a little bit of an initial advantage to creep away from the McLaren so right behind him in the uh, Daigle orange and white car, the McLaren, Steve Hartley closes in under braking, but as he gets in deep, that's because Dansenborg is braking just a little earlier to pick up the throttle a little earlier, and that allows him to get off the corner as well. So Mike Cantillon still leading from the two Tyrrells of Constable and Tyrrell. So Steve Brooks dropping back to fourth place in the JPS Lotus. Until moved up on the last lap into third place and trouble there. And is that Mike Cantillon? There was only one Williams ahead of them, wasn't there? Yes, I think there was, wasn't there? So that, unless it's a car that's been lapped, is that the arrows, the white arrows? Uh, not entirely sure. We'll have to pick that up. Meanwhile, the battle continues and the McLaren has the upper hand. Hartley goes ahead of Donsenborg. No, there is Mike Cantillon, car number seven, followed by. So I think it is that uh, it's either the white arrows or the. Uh, the Theodore. Now, uh, Theodore's red and white, isn't it? So it is that white arrows. Uh, so a lap behind now. Meanwhile, I wonder at which stage in the lap or in this race, it's a 20 minute race, we're halfway in. At what stage are we going to see that drivers really struggling with their neck muscles? Because that's always been a factor, even in the early 80s with the ground effect cars. The neck muscles really take a lot of punishment. The cornering forces are high. Yes, these cars are not being driven perhaps 100% as quickly as they were in period by absolute Grand Prix aces. But nevertheless, most of these drivers will be starting to feel that punishment already. Whether they're at the front of the field or the back, these Formula One cars are still a pretty brutal environment. They're rough, they're bumpy, particularly the ground effect cars, very firmly sprung. And Christoph Danzenberg at the tail of the field, having been passed by Steve Hartley, had another problem, a big looping moment. And again, when you're starting to fight the fatigue, and we are half a dozen laps in now, maybe that is all part of the equation. Also, just asking a little bit more than the car had. When the aerodynamic downforce goes away, suddenly the car relies a lot more on the mechanical grip. And you need an awful lot of experience to be able to match the two perfectly. So Christoph Dansenborg chasing, but still in sixth place, still ahead of Mark Hazel. Meanwhile, there is the Tyrrell 012, and that is behind the Theodore. So that's Ian Simmons in the red and white Theodore, and the later Tyrrell, the 012. It looks like the Theodore's in trouble, unfortunately. Uh, just uh, pulling off to the left there and hand out of the cockpit for Philip Hall, number 32 in the TR1 Theodore. 
So yes, there he is. So uh, trouble for uh, Theodore Carr, unfortunately. Looks like that's not going to be cheap. Through goes the black ensign. There's the Acela. Oh, and a loop, uh, looping spin for Steve Hartley. So what is it about fifth and sixth? Hartley passed Dansenborg, who spun. Now Hartley himself has spun. Did Christoph Dansenborg get back past him, I wonder? Let's take a look down the straight. Now the Williams doesn't seem to be in front, but he is much closer behind, isn't he? That's Christoph Dansenborg with the sort of orange highlights on the wing. And Hartley did the same as Dansenborg, the same place in Luffield where the speed is at the lowest, just asking too much of the tyres. So carrying speed into the mid corner, Steve Hartley spinning away. Still in fifth place though, but that opens up the gap. Steve Brooks in fourth in the Lotus now, but worry less about being caught. And there is the Theodore being pushed away. And that was driven in period by Keke Rosberg, uh, who went on to uh, take the World Championship, but uh, he won a very, very wet, and I remember it, soggy shoes, uh, Silverstone International Trophy 1978, and Keke Rosberg was peerless in the wet in that very car. 22, that's the ensign of Paul Tattersall from 1979. He's just going past Michael Fitzgerald. Uh, Michael in his... Uh, it was Michael who had the camera, wasn't it? Not uh, Charlie Kennedy. So Michael Fitzgerald in the Minardi 185. So a 1985 Minardi passed by a 1979 Enzyme. And back underneath goes the Minardi. It's Giancarlo Minardi team's first Formula One venture. They came up from Formula Two. And brought their Formula Two drivers led by Alessandro Nannini with them. They were a very successful Formula 2 team in the early 80s and then graduated to Formula 1 when such things were possible. Gets back in front of the Enzyme. So in fact the Theodore that we just saw at the side of the track designed by Mo Nunn, the, en uh, the Enzyme also designed by Mo Nunn, uh, hence the MN nomenclature. TR1 Theodore Racing chassis number one designed by Morris Nunn. And there is the Minardi just in front, so two different eras. And you can see how much further forward in the car the driver is in the Minardi. That was in the real sort of cab forward uh, era of, of Formula One drivers, where the driver almost sat between the, the front wheels. And you can see that also in the uh, car of Steve Brooks, that uh, Lotus 91T, the driver is well forward in the car. 91 rather, not 91T, that followed later. And Lotus got their hands on a turbocharged engine for the first time. The 91, the uh, last of their Cosworth engine cars. And then rule changes moved the drivers back, so the, the feet had to be behind the centre line of the rear wheels. It definitely was not in that period, and uh, having a frontal accident was not to be wished. Again, just struggling a little bit under braking the Minardi. So Mark Harris, uh, so uh, yeah, uh, Michael Fitzgerald losing that spot to the Theodore. Phil Hall goes back past him and it may be a little bit more than a struggle under braking. I wonder if he's lost gears. Cost with DFEs tend to be pretty reliable pieces of kit. They always said in the DFE era, when it stopped being rough and vibrating and went all smooth, that was when you switched it off, because that's when you knew it was going to blow up. It, it had that raw sound, the DFV, and uh, it's definitely drivers who are very used to it always talk about that sort of DFV vibration you get, because, of course, the engine was bolted rigidly to the monocoque. That's all part of it. The DFE was a not just the engine, it was a stressed part of the car. And the Kelamata Acela, again, that's another one of the sort of cab forward Formula One era. And unfortunately, that Acela is, looks like it's blowing oil as well. So into the pit lane comes the Acela. They're dropping like flies, aren't they? Mark Dwyer's in. Only three minutes remaining, though. So for our leaders, Mike Cantillon, on Jamie Constable. Ken Tyrrell up to third place. And there is the race. Oh, no, that's not. That's uh, Christoph Dansenborg, isn't it? 
Oh, no, it's not that. I beg your pardon. Mark Hazel. That's Mark that Hazel, one. yeah. All very similar looking cars. <laughs> there is the race leader. We've got a 7, a 27, and a 37. Not sure what happened to 17. But, uh, historically, for many years, Williams used 7 and 8. And Mike Cantillon with his Williams FW07 within uh, three minutes now of running out of time. So it'll be this lap plus another. And if you wonder what sort of lap times they were doing in period, well, it's fruitless to try and uh, compare because this is a very, very different place to the Silverstone of 1982, 1983. And it was basically a long, very fast circle with a couple of slow bits thrown in here. There's an awful lot more to it. Different distance, very different corners, very different layout to the early 80s Silverstone that saw qualifying lap from Keke Rosberg in his Williams averaging 160 miles an hour. That's not top speed, that's average for the entire lap, including the woodcut chicane. So it was a very, very fast circuit. In fact, for a number of years, quicker even than Monza. There's the race leader. That Cantillon, not too far away, two and a half seconds. That's one mistake, isn't it? One mistake, and suddenly we could be having a Tyrrell victory. Jamie Constable will know that and is keeping his nose to the wheel. And in fact, if Mike Cantillon has too much of a spin, Ken Tyrrell would slip through and we would get a Tyrrell 1 2 as well. So in the Frank Williams Memorial Trophy, I'm sure there'll be a lot of people here that are hoping that Mike Cantillon keeps his focus for one more lap, because there will be one more lap as he crosses the line. 55 seconds to go. That's a minute less than he needs to complete another lap. So this is the last lap of the race. Williams out on its own. Car number seven. Tyrrell's giving chase. 99, Jamie Constable behind him. 23, Ken Tyrrell, Steve Brooks in the Lotus in fourth. Watch the gap between them. Yeah, Brooks is very close indeed for third place. We might have a last lap lunge from Steve Brooks if he can summon up a bit so of something special from the Lotus. There he is. There is the Lotus. There is Ken Tyrrell in the second of the Tyrrell 011s. And that is not a very big margin. Not close enough for Steve Brooks to have a lunge here. And I wonder if he's got anything at all. His last lap was a 1 minute 54.6, 1 minute 55.3, though. Steve he's, Brooks had a spin. Yeah, just as I was looking up yes. the timing screen, he was much quicker on the previous lap, but just overcooked it there. And so Ken Tyrrell will be breathing a sigh of relief in third place. Mike Cantillon. Heading into the Beckett's S's, last chance for him to really enjoy this track at speed, and I'm sure all of these drivers are doing exactly that. Never driven a car with anything approaching this performance, but it must be just a wonderful thing to do. A full-fat Formula One car from the analog era with gears and a gear shift and a clutch pedal and everything else, and driving around the high-speed Silverstone Grand Prix circuit. And for much of it still, following in the wheel tracks of the great drivers that preceded you in these cars, what an opportunity. And for Mike Cantillon, well, he's made the very best of it again. Winner of yesterday's race, he wins again in the Frank Williams Memorial Trophy. Second for Jamie Constable, who finished in fifth yesterday. And third place for Ken Tyrrell, who was just uh, on the podium yesterday as well in third spot. Well, Alistair... For fans that are here that never saw these cars race in period, a great chance to see things that you might have seen in the books or in pictures, but more importantly, to hear them and to smell them and to get to see them up close in the paddock afterwards as well. They are just great looking devices. Absolutely they are, and it's uh, wonderful to see them uh, with our position uh, just over the old pit lane. We get the cars coming out of Woodcut, and it was absolutely took your breath away. Uh, when they were coming down the pit straight towards Cops Corner. Very much takes me back to the days when these cars were racing uh, in the early 80s. 
great to see. And that very car, the number seven car, uh, do you remember the grainy pictures that we used to get from the BBC? And yeah. uh, uh, no criticism there because uh, the way the BBC covered it meant that it grew into what it is these days and full coverage, but it, then it was kind of patchy coverage, wasn't it? But uh, well, this was the very car. Cameras that... were dodgy and, and, yes. and so were satellites. And then it was all commentated on a phone line as well. So it does feel very dated, doesn't it? It does. And uh, uh, this very car was the one that Carlos Ro Reutemann drove in 1981. Uh, and uh, he lost the world championship by one point to Nelson Piquet uh, because, and it's never been explained, Carlos was really off form that day at Caesars Palace and finished eighth and lost the world championship. Yeah, in modern parlance, he faxed that one in, didn't he? And it got lost in translation. Yeah, Reutemann just crumbled under the pressure. He never showed up, really, for that season finale. But for Nelson Piquet and Bernie Ecclestone's Brabham team, it was a first world championship for them together. And very much against expectation. Sure, you go as a title contender, but Reutemann basically just had to kind of finish and he would have been world champion for Williams and added yet another layer of glory to the Williams story, which at that stage was still really in its early days. Simod Sport Shoes. Now, there's a name you don't hear anymore, but, yeah, a very accurate period livery. As so many of the, the drivers and the car preparers are so, uh, so finickety about making sure the car is exactly as it was. There you go. The Ragnar Arrows. That was, a, again, a, a livery that went for several seasons. Looks absolutely spot on, and that takes you right back to the early 1980s, the same as... The McLaren behind. In fact, the McLaren behind, the uh, Mark Higson's helmet just really reminds you of Watties as well, actually. Predominantly white with the red around the bottom. Yeah. Wonder, I wonder if Wattie has driven that car since those seasons. That, that uh, race that you, that you mentioned, he came from right almost the tail of the field to win. A year later, came from 23rd on the grid to win, which I think is a, probably a last to first record that will never be beaten in contemporary Formula One. So it shows that even if you have a bad day, you never give up. Well, ex Keki Rosberg chassis of Mike Cancelon winning again. Rosberg famously uh, world champion with Williams, as was Alan Jones and a whole host of others. Of course, Nigel Mansell celebrating the 40th anniversary of his world championship this season and Damon Hill a world champion with Williams was here at the classic on Friday let's take a look at the results of the Frank Williams Memorial Trophy race to Mike Cantillon the winner on Saturday winning on Sunday Ken Tyrrell third as he was on Sunday but Jamie Constable in fifth place on Saturday's race makes it up into second Steve Brooks spun away the opportunity on the last lap to challenge for a podium finish Steve Hartley and Christoph Dantenborg in their battle for fifth both had a spin. Mark Hazel, who started on pole, sixth on day one. Mysteriously, a little off the pace today. But a great opportunity in the race to see cars that battled each other in periods going head to head again. And the two shadows, Ewan Sergison having a much better day in the red and white village of shadow right behind his. Uh, <laughs> Well, teammate, as it were, Mark Harrison in another DN9. And a couple of cars with mechanical problems, including Charlie Kennedy's Surtees, the Theodore of Philip Hall and Michael Fitzgerald's Minardi. Mark Dwyer also ending his race in the Acela in the pit lane. Formula One cars on the Silverstone Grand Prix circuit. It just fits, doesn't it? The home of the British Grand Prix once more echoed to the sounds of Cosworth DFVs from the pre-turbo era. McLaren versus Tyrrell versus Williams with a whole host of others thrown in as well. And as in the first race of the weekend, it was Williams that triumphed fittingly enough in the Frank Williams Memorial Trophy for the Masters Racing Legends. But there was action all the way down the field. Tyrrell claiming two podium spots. And cars from the Cosworth era proving that they are as hard to drive now and still look and sound as gorgeous as ever they did. And what a place 
to play with these fabulous toys.